I'm Lisa Hutchison, and I'll just introduce myself briefly. I work at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in geriatrics at the um, Donald W. Reynolds Institute on Aging. I obtained my degree from the University of Tennessee. I got a Bachelor's of Science in Pharmacy and then a PharmD there. Then I also received a Master's in Public Health at the University of South Florida. Um, I um, hope you'll enjoy geriatrics. I say it's the one special area that's going to touch almost everybody, even if it's not your patients. It's going to be your family, and you just can um, bet on that being an issue at some point in your life. So. so I have no uh, conflicts of interest for this subject matter. And you can see here my learning objectives on these next two slides is uh, summarizing age-related issues and assessments. And then we're going to focus on some disease states, dementia in particular, and um, the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. Then we'll also go into urinary incontinence, in, uh, including BPH treatment, and osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Here's my outline. You'll be able to kind of follow where we're at along the way. But obviously, pharmacotherapy in older adults is an increasingly important issue. We have more and more older adults, plus the epidemiologic uh, information shows us that these are the individuals that have the most adverse drug events. We um, use the most medications in this group, and they have the highest costs associated um, and bad outcomes. So to me, it's a very important um, thing to stay current with because you're going to uh, be the front line at trying to reduce this. Now, most of you probably remember from pharmacy school the, pharma the common pharmacokinetic changes that are seen in older adults. I have them summarized here. Absorption, we have um, some drugs that have a delay or a reduction in their absorption. It's not very many on the ones that it occurs in. It tends, if they're chronically used, uh, we tend to be able to readjust very easily, and it follows um, one another. Transdermal patches are less uh, predictable in older adults. Their skin and the fat pad under their skin uh, from person to person can change, and so it's not always um, predictable, and this is especially an uh, information you need to keep in mind when you're starting a fentanyl patch because it's such a narrow therapeutic index. Distribution is generally the volume is increased for drugs that are fat-soluble, decreased for water-soluble, and then if we have high protein binding, and many times our older adults are malnourished and have low albumin and other proteins in the serum. And so we have an increased free fraction. Metabolism may be reduced. The liver is smaller. The first pass effect is decreased, so we have higher bioavailability. You can use that kind of information as well as the others for new drugs on the market to really associate that the patient that's older is likely to not react the same as the younger patient as far as the pharmacokinetics. And then elimination is generally decreased. This, of course, is focused on kidneys and renal excretion. Um, other elimination may not be changed as much, but that one is an important factor. And I'll just show here with this um, chart that the information we have on um, the MDRD, which is so commonly reported now by our laboratories, uh, and helps us to estimate GFR is really not been validated in our oldest population as well as it's not got as many um, uh, studies showing where it would be a, as applicable for drug dosing. And so we still put the cockcroft galt creatinine clearance formula first as the way that we want to adjust drug dosing in our older adults. In addition to the changes in pharmacokinetics, we'll see changes in pharmacodynamics. And most often we see an increase in sensitivity to many of our medications that we can't explain by pharmacokinetic changes. In particular, central nervous system drugs like the benzodiazepines and the uh, opiates, uh, antipsychotics and tricyclic antidepressants, we see an increased sensitivity, especially to many of the um, side effects.
Warfarin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Warfarin, we see an increased risk for bleeding in older adults. Non-steroidals, we see increased GI bleeding um, with those. And then anticholinergics, especially in those that might have some kind of underlying C CNS disease state, we see an increased sensitivity to the uh, delirium uh, side effects, but also to the constipation and dry mouth with anticholinergics. Decreased sensitivity has been demonstrated with beta receptor drugs, and so the beta receptors tend to downregulate in older adults, probably because norepinephrine and epinephrine levels are higher in this group. So they downregulate, and the initial use of these drugs in a, a patient will uh, maybe not have as brisk a response as we might otherwise see in a younger adult. However, these uh, receptors will upregulate with time, and so you will see response. Lastly, what I have um, um, seen over and over, especially in a hospitalized patient setting, are impaired homeostasis. And so these drugs that are affecting our electrolyte or our fluid balance that you see listed here, as well as others, we tend to see if those get out of um, balance for our older adults, it takes much longer for them to re-equilibrate, even if we you know, do the right things. So, for instance, if we have a sodium issue that we're, and we're wanting to restrict fluid in a younger patient, that might be all we needed to do, and they would respond on their own. But in an older adult, it takes much more effort, and many times we have to um, uh, add some sodium if it's a hyponatremia, and it won't uh, respond as quickly in an older adult. So I have the first case here is an 85-year-old woman that resides with her daughter, and she has type 2 diabetes as well as hypertension, and she status posts a hip fracture. You can see here her list of medications, including glyburide, lisinopril, metformin, aspirin, multivitamin, melatonin is needed, and meclizine is needed, and then docusate twice daily. Her labs are pretty remarkable, especially for the kidney um, labs, the BUN and serum creatinine. And so we might want to um, be a little concerned about this lady and think about what pharmacokinetic changes um, might uh, be occurring and which medications would be most likely to cause a problem for her. So um, if you look through these, does it, do y'all have your um, cards available? Which set of medications do you think would be most likely to be problems? So good job. I see a lot of yellow out there. Yes? So these drugs are um, all p potential problems, but for different reasons. So aspirin, especially low dose, is going to be um, uh, less likely to cause a problem, although it is eliminated by esterases. These are not usually the ones that are a problem with older adults. And melatonin is very short-acting, so we don't see much F, uh, problems with those two. Uh, lisinopril can be a problem with the homeostasis issue. Meclizine has the anticholinergic effects, but less so with the pharmacokinetic issues. Lisinopril and metformin, well, the metformin is now contraindicated at this level of um, renal function uh, and the serum creatinine, and then, but then glyburide is on the beers list because of its renal elimination and the increase for hypoglycemia, uh, as well as metformin being contraindicated because of renal function. So that's why that is the best answer. But on the other side, what about the potential for pharmacodynamic sensitivity? Which medications would be most likely to be problems? Which group would you select? Okay, I see a few out there, but still some, uh, maybe some unsure individuals. But I would say B is our most likely problems because of pharmacodynamics, because we're looking at a drug, lisinopril, that's the homeostasis issue, and then meclizine is the anticholinergic issue. And so, to me, that's more pharmacokinetic, and we, or pharmacodynamic rather than pharmacokinetic, and so we just have to be more cautious with the dosing from the, from the get-go.
How do we assess drug use in older adults? There's a number of different categories of, of uh, drug-related problems. Overuse is probably the one we're most often used to seeing, especially unnecessary drugs such as the uh, GI, the proton pump inhibitors, et cetera, the CNS drugs. People get started on some of these and then they're never stopped and they don't have indications for use, as well as multivitamins and minerals. Sometimes we don't really have indications for that, but we're just uh, thinking that we can help the overall health. Underuse is also an issue. Uh, many times we're afraid of what drug-related problems the person might develop, even if they otherwise we don't know of why they would. We don't have an increased risk for some of these. Underdose drugs include anticoagulants, statins, and antihypertensives, particularly in the youngest old, where we have such a high uh, rate for um, heart disease. Non-inherents is can be of two types, unintentional, maybe the um, dosing regimen or there's so many drugs that the person can't keep up with it, or maybe their cognitive status is declining and it's more difficult for them to um, deal with a complicated regimen. Or it might be intentional. Many of our older adults say, oh, that drug's not going to help me. It's, uh, you know, I'm just old and that's just something I'm going to have to put up with. And they don't understand uh, the effects or when the effects should be seen. And so they may just decide not to take it or they may have adverse effects or cost may also influence that decision, just as in younger adults. Withdrawal syn syndromes can be an issue, especially with certain drugs like our cardiovascular and CNS drugs. I've also seen it with proton pump inhibitors where we're trying to get people off of those. It's best to taper many of these drugs down and then um, slowly get them off of these if they're not indicated any longer um, for our patients. And I just have here a few examples of some overprescribing with the cascade. One of the things we should always ask as pharmacists is if a person comes with a new side effect or a new um, effect, a new symptom, is this a side effect of a drug? And instead of just adding another drug on top of it, hopefully we can modify the original drug causing the effect. There are several other methods. Uh, that are several methods that are used to evaluate a medication regimen. The most common uh, and well-known is probably an explicit tool called the Beers List. And so the Beers List was recently updated in 2015, but it includes medications in all of these different categories here, and you can go to the AGS website and get access to this updated list. The new list had some minor changes with adding the proton pump inhibitors for long-term use, except in high-risk patients where it might be necessary, change some of the nitrofurantoin uh, concern, um, and uh, those were the main changes as other than taking drugs away, like for constipation, uh, drugs that caused that, and drugs that were mostly on there because of renal uh, changes and didn't have a lot of other um, reason to be there because that's, those are problems in all age groups, not just the elderly. And so trying to keep this manageable. It's important to know about this because these, uh, this explicit list is so easy to apply, and so not only has our federal government added the beers list to many of their regulatory um, um, surveys and when they're checking to see how good um, the medication management is for the elderly population, but it's also being added by Medicare Part D insurers, and so many people are starting to get these alerts at the uh, physicians' offices and other places to say, do we really need this drug for this patient because of the risk? However, there are many cases where an older adult would need some of these beers list medications, and so that becomes a problem for an explicit tool, and that's where an implicit tool has more of an application, at least at the clinical bedside, to me. I, I really like this, and I use it to teach my students how to address medication appropriateness using the Medication Appropriateness Index, because it could really be applied to all age groups, but it's been most studied in the older adults in multiple settings. And so as you can see here, there's about, there are 10 questions that you ask about each medication 
and it helps to decide uh, if we have our indication, if it's effective, it's dosed right, the directions are practical, et cetera. And so this helps us to identify if this is the best drug and, the, and a needed drug for this patient. Uh, the uh, one thing that it doesn't address are if are those underuse situations where a patient might need another drug, and we're not asking that question about what medications the patient would need to have added. Another tool that you'll be um, seeing and may have already seen, it's been out uh, two or three years now, is the Choosing Wisely campaign. And this is from the American Board of Internal Medicine where they have partnered with other organizations. So it's not just in geriatrics, but they have these um, Choosing Wisely lists for multiple other settings. But in um, geriatrics in particular, they have 10 items, 10 questions that you need to uh, address with a patient and seven of those ten have to do with medications, and I have them summarized for you here. But I think this is important because it's uh, widely accepted among the medical community as well as uh, the partners with the American Geriatric Society, and then these are being uh, promoted to the lay public as well. And so you may have patients asking these questions about themselves or their loved ones that are on these medications or that need a drug regimen review. Another assessment that becomes of paramount importance with our older adult has to do with functional assessment. What happens, we see, is our older adults is goal setting is sometimes not addressed, and so their needs and wants and desires may not be balanced with their therapies. It's important to ask the patient what their goals are. Sometimes cure is not as important to them if it means a great decrease in their quality of life. And so their instrumental activities of daily living and their activities of daily living become more important to evaluate and to identify if there are medications that are reducing those um, quality of life issues. Cognition is frequently an assessment that needs to be done, and we'll talk more about these tools when we uh, discuss dementia. But again, patients need to be able to function, and they need to have uh, good cognitive status in order to do that. Geriatric depression is a huge item. Uh, 30 to 50 percent of our older adults will have symptoms of depression, and so it's important for us to identify if that's an issue and to get them the therapy that they might need. Gait and balance, if you can't get up and walk or you can't transfer to your uh, wheelchair, those kind of things, become a very important issue for people to be independent at home. And so testing that and trying to come up with ways to improve it are very important. So as you can imagine, many of our adverse drug events could affect any of these areas and certainly decrease the patient's quality of life. Another thing to consider in the geriatric population is a kind of a change in the way to look at some of our disease states there. Most of our disease states we uh, tend to address in a linear fashion. We may not know the etiology or the pathogenesis, but we have a known set of defined symptoms that will tell us that yes, this person has that disease. And it tends to become linear where we've got an etiology that caused the pathology that then went on to uh, where the patient developed symptoms. There are many geriatric syndromes though that occur where the symptoms can have multiple etiologies. And the reason that they're having these symptoms isn't just because of one of that etiology or multiple etiologies, but also because of the interaction with their other pathologies. And so, for example, delirium is one of our common geriatric syndromes where we think about what are the multiple things that are playing a role with the delirium. The same for falls. We can't just say one thing, like it could be a drug is that as a part of that, and most likely is, it's one of the most common problems with falls and delirium. But it's also, what are we starting with? What other pathologic problems does the patient have that makes them increase risk 
or what other drugs are there on that cause drug-drug interactions. And so we think more of a concentric model when we think about geriatric syndromes where they um, have multiple things that are interacting together, but yet they come out with one presentation of delirium or of falls or of hospitalization. So in thinking about these assessments, assessment tools, and uh, the patient's goals of, of care, we can look at patient case number three. And now I didn't list on this slide all of the different medications this person's on. But let me read them uh, to you. It is in your workbook on, this, on the page um, 1-49. This lady is on uh, glipizide, 5 milligrams daily, lisinopril 10 daily, aspirin 81 daily, multivitamin, mirtazapine 15 at bedtime, calcium 500 twice daily, and tramadol 25 every 8 hours is needed for pain. So when you think about those different medications, and her functional assessment where she has been um, admitted to the hospital at, with a broken arm after a fall and then is now in rehab, which of these assessments would be most important for her quality of life and for getting her back to a level of independence the best that we can? What do you all think? I see a lot of uh, yellow, a little bit of red out there, so mostly we would think gait and balance needs to be assessed because that's going to keep her independent, more independent as long as possible. Now, the instrumental activities of daily living would be important to know what those are for her to be alone, but many times we can do, many, those with a family member can help with um, keeping the house clean, doing laundry, those kind of things with the instrumental activities of daily living, and she could still be independent at home. Depression and pressure sores would lead you on to think about it could contribute to an, uh, falls in the future, especially depression. Um, as, and if we're treating it with some of our antidepressants that have been associated with falls or uh, the same for other medications that are associated with falls, but we really need to um, get to the bottom of it with gait and balance before we make adjustments with the depression. And then pressure sores would not be the big issue because she is going to be, we're going to get her up, rehab, more mobility. So to maintain and improve function in this patient, which intervention would be best to implement? Do we have any thoughts on that out in the audience? So I see some green coming out, and so that is definitely in our guidelines. Uh, adding simvastatin, it's not that it would be uh, contraindicated at this, in this lady, but that at this point when we're trying to work with her in rehab, that might not be the first thing we need to worry about to improve her function. It might even cause muscle problems, so we would like to maybe look at that later. Increasing the lisinopril, uh, to try to get more advantage from that drug might also increase risk for hypotension. So probably not now without a real problem identified with high, high blood pressures. And then changing the tramadol to naproxen is really not the best choice because we're going to see an, a lady that is at this age is at high risk for GI problems. And so adding vitamin D twice daily is a recommended uh, strategy for all of our older adults to prevent falls and fracture. So there's some um, controversy right now on the falls. We've seen some literature come out that say, well, maybe it doesn't affect falls. Maybe it's not affecting the muscle strength as much as we think. But it's still going to, um, it's still known to prevent fractures. And so in somebody who's had a fracture, it certainly makes sense to add vitamin D to try to prevent future fractures. Okay, so now we're going to switch to talk some about dementia and delirium and um, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. So you're, I know you're well aware of the symptoms of dementia. Primarily, we think of cognitive decline with the MMSE of 24 or less. Uh, that's, the MMSE is a screen, and so once we have a, a number around 24, we really want that patient to go on and have the full diagnostic workup. But we, to do that, we have to rule out anything that we can identify as reversible, 
And so you see a list here of things that can be reversible causes of cognitive decline. And also think about the drugs that a patient might be on or if they're in delirium. To get the full diagnosis of dementia, we also have to identify how it has interfered with work or social function. And if we don't see any interference with that, then tend to call that mild cognitive impairment, and we're going to monitor that patient, kind of expecting that because a good percentage of those with mild cognitive impairment will move on to a full diagnosis of dementia. The delirium needs to be ruled out, and that's especially a problem. I work primarily with a hospital, uh, hospitalized adults with a consult team, and we see lots of people with delirium in the hospital, and we'll be consulted to evaluate them for dementia. Well, that's not when you can do that. For delirium, you want to use the uh, screening tool. One of the most common and gold standard ones is the confusion assessment method. And I use the term AFLAC duck to help me remember that because it's a cute and fluctuating course. The attention is altered, so they're inattentive. Their consciousness is altered. And there's disorganized thinking. And so you must have the acute onset and fluctuating course as, and the inattention, but then you have to have one or the other of either three or four to have a positive screen for uh, delirium. So we want to assure our patients not in delirium before we would evaluate them for dementia. Another component that we need to be aware of is that there are multiple kinds of dementia. Alzheimer's dementia is the most common, but there are many others out there, and, they, and I have on here some comparative information primarily focused on the treatment that might be different based on the type of dementia. So uh, vascular dementia, we have focal neurologic effects. We tend to see it occurring around a stroke. Sometimes we don't realize the patient's had a stroke, but we find it on some of our imaging. And you really want to focus on trying to treat cardiovascular risk factors in a person with vascular dementia. Lewy body dementia has some uh, alterations that include motor features of Parkinson's disease. We always think of visual hallucinations, but I have learned recently that it's, you know, it's not as common in Lewy body dementia as you might think. The key thing for us is to avoid typical antipsychotics because that has been shown to increase mortality and, uh, inc and rap more have a more rapid course in patients with Lewy body dementia, as you might expect because of the motor abnormalities being enhanced. And then one other that I just wanted to point out, frontotemporal dementia is usually younger uh, population compared to Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, the issue with this one as far as treatment is that cholinesterase inhibitors may worsen their agitation and behaviors. And so um, it's not a, just a given that if somebody has dementia, we're going to throw a cholinesterase inhibitor into the mix and it's going to help them. So don't assume that, particularly for these other types of dementia. So the dementia assessment and diagnosis, generally we're going to see one of these three screening tools used and then the actual diagnosis coming from that. These three are all 30-point scales. The MMSE is sort of the um, gold standard long-term one that we've all heard of, but because of copyright issues, the SLUMS, St. Louis University Mental Status Examination, and the MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, have started to take a role and have some advantages over the MMSE in um, some uh, t uh, settings. The MINICOG is the one I think has the most advantage for us as pharmacists in that it's easy to administer. It takes just a few minutes where you have a recall for uh, giving three words, then you have the clock draw test, and then you ask for those three words again. And so it's so easy to administer, and it can be that screen. I've heard of it being used in assisted living facilities and other places where we can assure a person has the cognitive abilities to actually manage their own medications. What you're going to hear more and more about are these final three with biomarkers with the, in the uh, CSF fluid looking at um, beta amyloid and tau protein levels, as well as the PET scan with nuclear markers that will actually go to the amyloid plaques and show that in the, where that is in the brain. And then an MRI with looking at atrophy of the hippocampal 
uh, region of the brain. And so those are used in research now, hopefully to separate out even more clearly our patients with Alzheimer's dementia that would then be eligible for research protocols. And hopefully we will use that and find some better drugs and additional drugs to help. So um, this uh, next case is an 84-year-old uh, widow living alone that is independent, and she has medications, hydrochlorothiazide for hypertension, and tolteridine, LA, for incontinence, escitalopram for depression, and acetaminophen as needed, as well as the calcium for osteoporosis. Her MMSE is positive at 23 out of 30, and on exam, there's no reason to suspect Lewy body dementia or some or other types of dementia. What change would be indicated at this point? All right, I see a lot of you with red, and that's true. You can occasionally, I'll see people that have moved on and already added to Nepazil given the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Um, hopefully, we don't see that as much as we have in the past. We've seen people just automatically add the B12, assuming they have that uh, reduction in B12 levels, but we really need to have that um, information before we start them on an injection monthly. And then switching from hydrochlorothiazide to lisinopril probably isn't going to make much difference. Um, but really discontinuing her tolteridine, when she's right here at this borderline, we might see some cognitive effects from that drug, and then reassessing would be the best answer. So um, there's not really a whole lot new with pharmacologic treatments for Alzheimer's dementia. You see the four drugs listed here. We do have the higher doses of denepazil and ribostigmine uh, that, are, uh, that can be used if somebody has uh, been on the five or 10 uh, for a period of time and then they start to show no um, or less response. Many times we might consider increasing that, but it's been very difficult for patients to tolerate. And in the original Donepazil study, about 50% of them couldn't tolerate going to the higher dose. Um, and then memantine is the drug with a, a different mechanism of action, and it's really shown only effective in moderate to severe dementia, uh, Alzheimer's dementia. And so we tend to, um, I used to see it added on a lot more quickly, for patients, but now we're, uh, because it's not been shown effective in mild disease, we see it held back until moderate to severe. The side effects tend to be uh, very similar for all the cholinesterase inhibitors. Memantine has some kind of uh, agitation, can also cause incontinence, um, just some different uh, things there. The consensus treatment guidelines are now over a decade old, and so they uh, tend to uh, be useful somewhat, initiate and titrate the cholinesterase inhibitor to maintenance doses. But in general, what we see is that um, we're going to start the drug and then escalate uh, and evaluate the effect from three to six months. And then at advanced stages of disease, and there's a lot of controversy as to when that is, we may or may not start, stop the drug. But once a person is bed bound, definitely we're probably not getting much advantage for these uh, cholinesterase inhibitors or memantine. And so it would be worth uh, while to consider stopping those. How much benefit you get is very controversial. Um, some people say it's statistically significant, but not clinically significant. Um, even the original studies, a third of patients on cholinesterase inhibitors seemed to have benefit. A third were kind of stayed the same, and whether that was, you know, kept the disease from progressing versus then the third that got worse. Not everybody's going to respond to these. Okay, so patient case number six, we have a gentleman who's on rivastigmine, but, and it seems to have caused some improvement, but he's having nausea and vomiting that they can't quite get a handle on. So which recommendation would you um, want to suggest? I see some red, excellent. So the patch has been shown to have less nausea and vomiting associated with it. Probably we have more steady levels. Uh, of rivastigmine. Using an antacid is not shown to really reduce the nausea and vomiting from cholinesterase inhibitors. 
Um, it's not really time to discontinue it since we're getting some benefit if we could just get a handle on the adverse events. And then adding an anticholinergic is not in this patient's best interest, although it might affect the nausea and vomiting. It's probably going to affect his uh, cognitive status to an, an extent that would be uh, quite harmful. Case number seven, we have a 75-year-old woman that has been on Denebazil 10 for three years. Her MMSE is starting to fall from the, uh, having a mild to moderate disease. She can't tolerate Denepazil 23, which would be another course of action that we could try. So I see some red, and that is the correct answer. It's, there's no um, evidence that retrying Denepazil is going to give us an effect that's uh, different than the first trial, so no reason to retry that. Um, adding vitamin E has not been shown conclusively to reduce um, cognitive symptoms with uh, dementia. There is some evidence that's controversial on both sides as to whether it reduces progression to dementia if you have mild cognitive impairment. Uh, and switching to rivastigmine patch would not be uh, a, a better option because it's probably not going to provide any more advantage for her. Okay, symptoms during Alzheimer's disease progression are associated with the, an MMSE score as it decreases. You start seeing more of these non-cognitive symptoms like mood swings, personality changes, agitation and psychosis, insomnia, and, uh, and gait changes. And so this is an important issue for people and their families trying to keep patients at home especially. So assessing for uh, these behavioral symptoms, always look for a medical reason. It could be a drug that's been added. We need to always check for that. Pain is a big concern because these patients start to not be able to communicate that they have pain. And so we end up, uh, it, sometimes we need to assess that more specifically. And they don't remember if you say, well, did you have pain last week? Well, they don't remember last week. So you just have to kind of focus on now, and they might not even be able to tell you, but looking for grimacing and other things when you move different parts of the body. There are some tools that you can use to assess for uh, behavioral symptoms. I don't see these used much clinically, but in research. The important thing clinically is that you've actually documented what the problem is and how often it occurs and what things make it worse or what things might make it better so that it, you can actually see when you make a change if, you were, if it was an effective change or not. So non-pharmacologic treatment is our number one go-to first. We want to think about that first. Try to identify unmet needs is what uh, we like to use that phrase because it becomes like a detective story where you've got to figure out for this patient what's wrong. And then when you implement non-pharmacologic changes, think about that person and their history. So if we're like looking at music, we want to play music that they enjoyed when they were young, not music that we might enjoy, because that might just make them more agitated. Aromatherapy, they, you know, lavender and calming things. I think the smell of bread baking is like the best aromatherapy there is, for me anyway. It makes me calm. So uh, some, maybe it's an accountant or a bookkeeper that you're working with. Games with numbers might be another way to distract this person. Uh, the most likely symptoms to respond to pharmacologic measures would be wandering, hoarding, repetitive questions, withdrawal, and apathy, as you see here. They don't respond very much to medication. So it always ask if the behavior is dangerous or there's some harm to the patient or social relations, and then have we tried to our best of our ability non-pharmacologic measures? Because if we haven't, then we need to do that first before going to drug therapy. But there are occasions when we might require emergency uh, treatment and that's I see that in a hospital you know somebody's just out of surgery and they have a lot of behavioral issues before and now they've got delirium on top of it sometimes we have to use medications but always think through those before you actually start and so the treatments are listed here I've given some uh, suggestions for non uh, pharmacologic or some cautions like trying to limit benzodiazepines because they tend to make things worse 
um, giving a safe place to wander for somebody who's walking around and you can't get them to sit still. If you can just let them walk, then sometimes that will be the best thing. The Cochrane Review suggests the best evidence for pharmacologic therapy are, is shown with risperidone and olanzapine. But if we do have somebody that has some Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia, then uh, quetiapin might be a better choice because it has less of the EPS reactions. The keys are to use for as short a time as possible and uh, to be sure you tell the family about the adverse effects because increased mortality is a major concern. We have a comparative effectiveness reports that show the number needed to harm includes one death for every 100 patients and one stroke for every 53 patients. So the strength of evidence is pretty high and the risk for harm is, uh, very, is definitely there. So on our uh, case number nine, eight and nine, we have an 87 year old woman that's in a secure dementia unit. You can see here her medications, her MMSE is dropped down to five. She's crying, help me, help me, around 5 p.m which is not unusual, we call that sundowning. The day cues, day and night cues get mixed up and it's starting to get dark. So what would be the most appropriate for this patient? Hopefully I've said non-pharmacologic 15 million times so that you would say, <laughs> begin music therapy. Oh, that's not supposed to happen. That's supposed to happen, <laughs> sorry about that. I didn't realize that was coming up. All right, begin music therapy with songs the patient enjoyed when younger. And this is a distracting type of thing to help her uh, deal with the uh, day-night cues. The ibuprofen, you might want to look at pain as an issue, although it would unlikely be just this one time of day, but acetaminophen would be safer. Ordering haloperidol, you would never use this dose, and you don't want to use it until after you've tried music therapy or some other non-pharmacologic. And then moving a patient to a private room would uh, actually could make that worse because she needs that stimulation of a social contact. After two months, her agitation increases so that you can't feed or bathe her, so now it's becoming an issue for care. So at this point, what's the best pharmacologic approach, because we've tried all of our non-pharmacologic without success. Okay, so of these choices, quetiapin. We do have more evidence with olanzapine and uh, risperidone, but quetiapin in her case is better. Um, melatonin at bedtime, if it was insomnia, you might consider that as a, a first step, but that's not her complaints. Increasing the denepazil hasn't been shown to affect the agitation anymore. And there is one study with citalopram that says it might be a good choice for agitation, but until we get more confirmation on that, it might not be our first um, step. Okay, so we're getting close to the end because there's not a whole lot um, uh, to add as far as new things on our last few disease states. So urinary continence, incontinence, and uh, BPH. Uh, very common in older adults, 38% of women have incontinence and 17% of men. And of course that raises up quite considerably if you have uh, patients in the nursing home. We want to look for reversible causes first if we can, and uh, certainly there are drugs that can increase your risk for incontinence. So please do a, a good job of evaluating those, or if it's one of these others that we can um, affect, impaction, for example, or treat an infection, don't label the person incontinent until after we've treated that and uh, looked down the future. Just to refresh your memory, we have the um, mu, um, I mean the, uh, I'm sorry, muscarinic M3 receptors here on the bladder muscle, and uh, the alpha receptors down here at the urethra, and then beta receptors have more to do with um, storage of the urine as compared to um, the um, muscarinic receptors that have more to do with the um, elimination. So. That's summarized for you here on this slide.
But do realize that normal urination includes all of these, but an effect on either side can um, cause different types of urinary incontinence. So here we have a comparison of the different types of urinary incontinence, urge, stress, overflow, functional, and then mixed can be especially as common with stress and overactive. But we want to look for drugs that we can stop for each of these types of urinary incontinence in order to maybe avoid having to do other therapies or other treatments in the future. Non-pharmacologic interventions are also a good choice for these, um, for urinary incontinence, particularly pelvic floor exercises or Kegel exercises and exercise and weight loss if needed to help strengthen those muscles uh, or have them have less resistance to fight with. These are especially useful for um, the uh, urge and stress incontinence, but can also be used in other types. Um, biofeedback and scheduled time voiding are also commonly used. Um, I don't see as many pessaries, collagen, or bulking agents, but especially if we've tried everything else and tried our, our drugs or patients can't tolerate our drugs, then our urologist friends can help us with the, putting the patient um, in one of the systems to get one of these. And then and BPH prostatectomy or self-catheterization may be, and for overflow incontinence, may be indicated for very severe disease. So your urge incontinence, anticholinergics are first-line agents. Of course, we don't like them in the elderly, so please you know, be judicious. They tend to have equivalent efficacy. Uh, our next category are the beta-3 agonists, which we just have one on the market right now. There's no comparisons done so far to the anticholinergic, so we don't really have a good feel for how much better or worse they might be or if they're equivalent. And then the side effects are a different profile, so hypertension being one of the most common uh, uh, diagnoses in our older adults might inhibit us from using beta-3 agonists. And then botulinum toxin A injection is being used more frequently. It can only be used if we can be sure that the person can be catheterized and is cognitively aware, able to come back if they can't urinate because it can cause voiding difficulty. But this has become, uh, has become a um, FDA-approved indication. The thing about choosing among our anticholinergics is we tend to look mostly at the side effects. And here you see with this chart that there's some um, differences in the dry mouth, constipation, and dizziness. And so it might lead you to use uh, different agents, the, uh, maybe the more selective agents or the ones that don't cross blood-brain barrier versus dry mouth. You might want to choose the transdermal. Stress incontinence, we don't have as much um, efficacy with our drugs. Alpha adrenergic agonists are sometimes used. Topical estrogens in women that are postmenopausal, if there's, uh, especially if there are other symptoms of uh, estrogen deficiency, that one I do see pretty often. And then duloxetine's a choice, but the evidence is limited on that. We frequently start and stay with the non-pharmacologic treatments for this type of incontinence. Overflow incontinence will um, focus on alpha adrenergic agonists, five alpha reductase inhibitors, especially um, if we have BPH going on, and then phosphodiesterase five inhibitors. We'll actually talk more about those with our BPH treatment. So in this uh, case, 75-year-old woman reports ur urgency, frequency, loss of urine. So this is urge incontinence, wears a pad at night that she has to change. Uh, she does have an MMSE of 25, osteoporosis, I mean osteoarthritis and hypothyroidism. So PVR is normal. What intervention would be best? So... Pelvic floor exercises and solafenacin would probably be our best choice. We don't. We always want to start with pelvic floor exercises if possible, and then adding the solafenacin because it is more selective. In her case, since she's borderline with her MMSE, so that's why tolteridine would not be the best choice. And then the other A and B are not best because we always, if we have a chance, we want to include pelvic floor exercises. <laughs> 
Okay, BPH, another very common illness. It's um, mostly here. The thing to think of is our symptom index from the American Urological Association helps guide treatment from zero to five. We tend to not treat those individuals very much. They don't have very many symptoms, but moderate. We're going to probably use pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic too. But over 19 is where we start thinking about surgery for BPH. The alpha adrenergic blockers relieve the symptoms. They do have significant adverse effects, uh, particularly the orthostatic hypotension. If you have someone that needs to undergo cataract surgery, it's better to go ahead and have that before. Uh, but if not, that they need to be sure and tell the surgeon because they will have this floppy iris syndrome that they have to do different techniques with the surgery. Alpha reductase inhibitors will modify the course of uh, disease. So the uh, five, anyway, and they, uh, but they are uh, not useful in pregnant patients that um, might be around pregnant patients or family members, I should say. Um, uh, risk for high-grade prostate tumors is another concern. So the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, Tadalafil, is indicated for this for BPH. It's a smooth muscle relaxer in the bladder, urethra, and prostate. It's given once a day. It is not supposed to be used with alpha blockers due to the risk for hypotension. And if you can't get away with that, you still need to use both drugs for some reason. It's best to separate the dosing by five, four hours so that you can have less risk for hypotension. Um, so there are some times when you might need combination therapy. They're listed here. I have seen some patients get anticholinergic drugs on top of this, which in my mind, you know, is opposite what we should be doing because they might have overflow incontinence. But there are times when maybe as needed would help the uh, patient to avoid the urge incontinence that uh, if they have storage symptoms. And then assess for the uh, post-void residual before using combination because we want to make sure we don't tip them over into a... Uh, uh, problem with uh, urinary obstruction. So case number 11 is here, 85-year-old man. Which therapy is best? He's in the middle range, so we probably would want to treat with tamsulosin. The lower risk for um, problems with his blood pressure Finasteride is not as commonly indicated if the uh, prostate volume is less than 40 grams. So tamsulosin would be the best choice here. Osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, coming down to the final um, disease states. Osteoarthritis is most best if we can start with non-pharmacologic treatments, especially if we can do, encourage exercise and weight loss. These will de decrease pain and disability, have been proven to do so. Topical agents, we try to encourage those at this point because we have so many side effects in older adults with our oral agents. And so these might be especially useful where the joints are near the surface. And so knees, hands, smaller joints. I just heard a, a presentation talking about the foot. So several of the joints in the foot are near the surface. So topical agents might be useful there where you're using uh, salicylic acid derivatives or as you want to use uh, diclofenac and those type of um, agents. Injections, if you have a single joint problem, and this is especially useful for the hip, we can't use topicals to get into the hip. So glucocorticoids may work for up to three months and then hyaluronins as for 30 weeks. And there are limits to how many times you can give these injections per year especially. So that can be a problem. Our oral agents always think of acetaminophen first. Now we do have to worry about uh, scheduled dosing to make it work the best. We have to worry about not uh, overlapping with other products that have acetaminophen in them. The uh, FDA has done a great job of trying to eliminate that uh, issue, but it still um, rears its head every once in a while. And then glucosamine is a, a 
dietary supplement that some people say work, but the evidence is kind of back and forth on that. So I usually have patients that come and ask me about it, and so if they're, as long as they're doing everything else they can, it's not a problem for me, and there's no contraindications for, her to, for him or her to use glucosamine. Um, they can try it, but it's not. But don't expect it to do a whole lot. I don't think. Nonsteroidals are our next um, set of agents to think about, but we do have an increased risk for GI bleeding in our older adults. So we'd like to avoid chronic use if possible. If we can't avoid that, then we want to add a PPI. Uh, you could also consider switching to COX-2, the celecoxib. All right. Um, do consider if the person's also on aspirin for prophylaxis and we're adding a nonsteroidal, the aspirin won't work as well if they take them at the same time. So ha it's best to switch those to have a, some uh, 30 minutes or an hour between. And then obviously renal insufficiency is very common in our older adults, so that can't, uh, that would be a contraindication for us to use nonsteroidals. Opioids are actually recommended, and according to guidelines, if a patient is a poor candidate for the chronic nonsteroidal use, and the three main categories over age 75, prior GI bleeding, or oral anticoagulants. So we do want to consider them because this is going to help the patient's quality of life. But of course, with the current um, atmosphere and the concerns about opiate um, uh, addiction and all the deaths that have been occurring, we need to be especially cautious and do a lot of good patient counseling and titrate up slowly. So case number 12 is an 85-year-old man with pain from hip osteoarthritis. And you can see he has other disease states. He's on acetaminophen three times daily and reports that it helps, but he still has pain and he's not able to walk as much as he would like to. So if we wanted to add another intervention, which one of these would you choose? So B is the correct answer according to our guidelines because he's really not um, a candidate for some of these other things because of his increased age. And glucosamine's not really a, a good um, um, choice for him. Now if we added a PPI, we might could do ibuprofen or celecoxib might be an option, but according to guidelines, hydrocodone's really what they want you to move towards. Okay, hey, rheumatoid arthritis, again, not a lot of new stuff with rheumatoid arthritis, but it's generally a bilateral inflammatory arthritis, and the key thing is we have identified some poor prognostic indicators that would push us to do more uh, aggressive treatment to try to prevent the long-term effects. DMARDS should always be used within three months of diagnosis because we do want to avoid all of those um, problems with the joints. And then severe disease is going to require a combination of agents in most cases. We do use nonsteroidals and corticosteroids in rheumatoid arthritis, but n not by themselves. These are really just to bridge the gap until we get our effect from the DMARD. The thing we can really help patients with are the comorbid conditions. These patients are at an increased risk, particularly of cardiovascular disease. That's really the, uh, one of the most leading causes of death for rheumatoid arthritis patients. The European guidelines recommend multiplying risk factors, uh, risk score by one and a half, and then treating them that way if you're using some guidelines that look at risk factors. The risk for infection is elevated, as well as malignancy and osteoporosis. So um, do look at calcium and vitamin D for these patients, as well as biphosphonates. Uh, and then think about the, the uh, infections, the pulmonary, the uh, sepsis, TB, and hepatitis B that are more common in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and particularly if we're going to use some of our biologic agents. So our last case is an, this lady who um, has uh, had RA for a year. And then she's begun therapy, did okay, for, but is, um, now we've got um, hand joints showing progression of joint space, narrowing, and bony erosion. So what's the next best step for her given our choices? Methotrexate is usually our first line, but if it's losing its ability, then we've got to look at other options. <clears throat> 
Any ideas on what you think the next step would be? I see A's, and that is correct. We're going to go to a biologic agent. Uh, changing to leflunamide or hydroxyzine by itself is probably not going to give us that advantage. They're not going to be any better than what methotrexate was able to do. We might add prednisone to the bri to bridge, but we need to have a definitive um, drug that's going to affect the disease state and the progression. So etanercept is going to be our next best choice. All right, so I'm kind of at the end of the last 30 seconds, so I'll take one question from the audience.